Hello everyone, this is the Q&A video special. I've put all your questions all together. There's about 64 to get through. So let's crack on, shall we? What are the requirements you need out of a film in order to do a retrospective review, aside from how long it's been since the film came out? Um, for me to do a retrospective, it has to be a film I'm familiar with. It has to be an HD version available as well, because I like to work in HD. I don't like to sort of use DVD quality rips, which I have done before with some reviews. Um, the soundtrack as well has got to be available and so I can mix in the music with the review. I mean, if there's no score available, it makes it very difficult for me to sort of make something on a presentation level that's to a good standard. Um, I mean, I get a lot of requests for films which I've never seen and it's sometimes difficult for me to say no to certain reviews, um, but um, I have to be familiar with it and that's something I've watched a number of times to, to give it a sort of credible review. How long does it normally take to produce a retrospective? Also, how do you decide which movies get chosen for each season? Um, I don't really have a list of chosen films. Sometimes I have like maybe three I've chosen for, like for the next couple of weeks. And then maybe at the last minute I'll change my mind and do something else. It's never like a set 10 films or whatever. It'll always be the next, maybe after two reviews, I'll say, oh, I'm going to do this one out of the blue. Um, but it usually takes me about just over a week to get them done. Um, it used to be a lot quicker maybe because the videos were a lot shorter a couple of years ago. Now they're 20 minutes plus now. So I get the preview done, like the intro and the ending of a, of a video done in the space of a couple of days. Then I'll write for maybe two days and research it and then edit it all. So maybe at max it takes me about eight or nine days now to do one. Will you ever do a retrospective on In the Line of Fire? In the Line of Fire, I've never seen it. I do apologize. So um, I, I will give it a go. I will, I will watch it just for you. So. So I can give it a honest my honest feedback on it. But sometimes people request a film and I do watch it and I think, oh, I don't really want to review it. So we'll see, we'll see. Best film you have ever seen and worst film you've ever seen? It's hard to say a best film. Um, there's loads of films I've said that are my favourites, like Robocop, Superman the Movie and Ghostbusters. But I could say the worst film I've seen, viewing experience, was Double Dragon the Movie. It was painfully bad and I watched it as... In, when I was about 14 my friend had rented it and we watched it one evening I just could not get through it it was such a bore fest so yes go with Double Dragon number one what are your favourite video games number two thoughts on Edge of Tomorrow from what you've seen number three do you watch any reviewers uh, favourite video games I mean as a kid um, I'd probably say Street Fighter 2 series was one I was obsessed with a bit too much you know I collected everything on Street Fighter 2 related so that was probably be the number one game uh, on my list um, and probably Resident Evil the remake now that is probably one of my favourite games and I'm playing it again this week um, Edge of Tomorrow I, I saw some of the trailers it looked really interesting but I wasn't like I, I was desperate to see it but from the reviews this week people are saying it's really good so I'll probably catch it next week if I can um, other reviewers um, there's a couple of people I watch from That Guy with the Glasses, like uh, Cinema Snob, Film Brain, and Mike J. Um, and there's a couple of other people that follow me that I try and watch their work as well, to sort of give them support and um, give them any advice they need to, and sort of you know improve their channel as such. But um, there's only a couple of a couple of reviewers I watch on a regular basis. Um, I mostly watch like video game like reviewers as well, but uh, I'll go into that in greater detail later on. Are there any movies that you refuse to cover? Any movies that I refuse to cover? Probably romantic rom-coms, rom there you go. Rom-coms are the ones I, I won't review. And probably it's like the Star Wars prequels, there's, there's no point in going through those. I mean, Red Letter Media did a great review on those films. And um, well, if, if, hard, if, I, if I was hard pressed to do a Star Wars prequel, it would probably be like episode three. Because there's some good stuff in there, but not much. But uh, anyway, next one. Do you think you could do an Evil Dead retrospective? I'd love to see that. Also, are you a filmmaker yourself because you seem to have a talent for editing? Uh, Evil Dead, um, yes, I will be doing an Evil Dead retrospective in October, so Halloween season, so I've got a number of films I want to review that month. Um, I'm not sure which Evil Dead film. I may go with Army of Darkness because you've got the different cuts, so many, so many versions of that film available. It will make far more of an interesting retrospective. Uh, Filmmaker-wise, I'm not a filmmaker. I, I, I'm not really one for directing and writing scripts, but uh, my speciality is editing, uh, I think anyway. <laughs> um, but that's the key area I, I like to focus on.
What do you think of the film Rear Window? Rear Window, I have not seen. There's a, <laughs> I can see my friend Richard off camera just going, <gasps> Um, there's a few like Alfred Hitchcock films I have not seen, and Rear Window is one that I haven't. So it's the best one. It's supposed to be the best one. R- Richard's whispering <laughs> off camera. It, it's, it, oh god, yeah, I, I will watch it. I need to get the box set of Hitchcock movies, and uh, I'll let you know my thoughts after I've watched them. I know it's a lot newer than most of your retrospectives, but when are you doing a Man of Steel review? What do you find the most rewarding or receive most joy from since you started doing these retrospective reviews? Man of Steel is something I get asked a lot. Um, I mean, I, me, me and my friend Richard, we, we had watched it and reviewed it when it came out. And um, I'm supposed to be doing a commentary soon with Geekvolution. Um, but I haven't really been hard pressed to do a retrospective on Man of Steel. I, and even though I've done every other Superman film as a retrospective, um, I may give it another year or two. Actually, I'll prob- I may do it when the next Superman film comes out. But I may change my mind and maybe later in the year I'll be like, yes, I want to do a retrospective. I may do one on Man of Steel, but at the moment I'm currently not that eager to do one. Um, most rewarding stuff I've experienced with YouTube is communicating with other people and getting their feedback and uh, hearing their thoughts on my work. Um, I'm always more than happy to reply to comments and I always read, I try to read everyone's feedback, even, even if it's negative, you know. Um, I mean, what I've been most surprised by, a lot of people that have, that follow me are filmmakers themselves and also other other critics and they love showing my work and discussing with me films they enjoy watching and um, it sort of you know gained more sort of friends as it were you know um, and also it's really nice to you know show people my work and see how it's going to play to them because in my eyes you're always overly critical on yourself anyway I am um, I'm terrible for that and uh, I scrutinize what I've said or how I've presented a, ref- a film, and and I go over over and over again before I put it online. And even though, even when I have done it, I've put it online, shared it with everyone. I'm like, oh no, I didn't like that bit, or I should have changed that bit. But other people say, well, because I've watched it over and over again, I can see the flaws in, cer- in certain things. Um, but you know, when I put up a review and the feedback the first few days, you know, it's really good. You know, loads of comments. It's, it's great to see uh, that people are enjoying my work, and uh, and I, I see regular people every week, the same followers commenting, showing my work, and it's great to see that they've stuck with me through these last couple of years. And there's new people every day, and um, it's fantastic. That's you know the best uh, thing I could have wanted out of this. Um, but yeah, that's the most rewarding experience so far with YouTube. Would like to know your opinion on what actor you thought gave the most stand-up performance in a highly slated or mediocre movie. Could be an actor that never made it big or is now forgotten. Um, that's a very hard question. Um, I mean, Peter Weller is like one actor who seems to sort of be in a lot of sort of crappy films, but he's always really good in them. I mean, aside from Robocop, which is an amazing film and a great performance, I mean, he's seen like that film Screamers, and that's not a very good film, but Peter Weller's very good in that. And Leviathan's a very silly kind of you know B movie which I've reviewed but he's very good in that so um, I mean Peter Weller is an actor who really hasn't never really made it to an A-list celebrity I think I think he's kind of may have chosen that route himself to sort of not being a public public eye that much but I mean he's in Star Trek Into Darkness and a lot of people were like some people were probably like never seen him before so it's good for sort of more movie buffs to see hey it's Robocop in a Star Trek film so uh, yeah I, I'm going with Peter Weller What's a film you saw that was so bad that you tried to get your money back on? I've never been to the cinema and watched a film that I've hated so much that I had to walk out. Um, I always generally go in with a sort of vague idea that I seem interested in, in a movie. <laughs> the only time recently, actually, I went to, to see Superman the movie at the Prince Charles Cinema in London and the print was so fucked. Um, I walked out halfway and got my money back. And I got my money back from a film I absolutely adore. I love Superman the movie, but I got my money back. It's like, no point wasting £10 plus on a film print that's completely scratched to buggery. Um, so yes, that's the only time I got my money back. So I won't be going to that cinema ever again. Are there any films that you like but everyone else hates and vice versa? Um, I like the Green Lantern movie and everyone else hates it. Uh, it's weird. It's very weird. Um, I think because and there's, there's some good action bits in the film, but the action is quite limited I mean the best act at the end where he's got to fight that giant cloud of shit 
and he's got his ring and stuff and he starts you know trying to save everyone uh, I think it's really good and the music, I really love the score as well to Green Lantern and Ryan Reynolds does look like Hal Jordan even though he's I think he plays him not like just like the comics he kind of plays him a lot differently um, I think well some people would tell me but that's the one film everyone seems to hate but I like do you plan to review any classic black and white movies in the future movies like Frankenstein 12 Angry Men Psycho etc um, black and white movies are never really out of the equation uh, they just really haven't really came to my attention um, or ones that I've, I've watched and you know fondly admired actually The Man Who Wasn't There um, I think the Coen Brothers film um, that's the one black and white movie I would love to review um, so probably that but I mean things like from the 30s and 40s sort of action movies or horror movies sorry the classic horror films like Wolfenstein and Wolfenstein the classic movies like The Wolfman and The Frankenstein um, i I don't really, I'm not really that interested in. So um, maybe in the future I may come across more black and white films I would want to review. But at the moment, there's only one or two. What's your favourite comic book film that's not Batman or Superman and the really popular heroes? And will you ever review Watchmen? Um, other superhero films I like, or superheroes? Um, Spider Man. Spider Man 2, I actually love that film. I love the first Thor film. Uh, some people think it's a very average film, but I love the sort of visual design of the film and, um, and the score as well. I'm big, you know, when it comes to. A, a superhero film with a good score I, I'm that much more attracted to it um, Watchmen um, the weird thing is I watched Watchmen again the other day and I really like Watchmen but some of my friends who love the original book don't like the film and and taking on Watchmen will be quite a difficult task because um, I have to obviously go and read the book which I haven't read which I know I should do it's supposed to be a very good book and um, <laughs> Rich is like shaking his head off camera going Oliver um, but um, it's it will be a very tough task to do, and I, I, I may do it at one point, but um, at the moment there isn't much of a personal drive to do it. It's just a, I like the film, but it's I know it's quite a lot to cover um, for me. But if if someone paid me to do it, someone goes, "Here you go, I have two hundred bucks to do it," I'll be like, "Yeah, okay," <laughs> but not for free, I suppose. <laughs> what flicks will you absolutely not review, and would you ever review a TV show? Um, I think I've probably answered. Uh, films that I would not review but a TV show I will be reviewing The Flash 1990 TV show which I do own now and I will be uh, reviewing the Superboy TV show from the 80s and early 90s so I need to get hold of seasons 2, 3 and 4 first I've only got season 1 I've got like 2, 3 and 4 like VHS quality rips but there's now DVDs out which I want to get so The Flash and Superboy will be coming later in the year Would you ever consider doing retrospective style reviews of other media like television series video games etc um, as I said in the previous answer, I, I will be doing The Flash and Superboy. Uh, video games, n not particularly. I mean, I because I, I said earlier that I was a big fan of Street Fighter, that I may do one on Street Fighter 2 um, at one point. Um, but at, at the moment, I'm just focusing on movies. What are your thoughts on the release photo of Ben Affleck in the new Batsuit and Superman v Batman Dawn of Justice? The new Batsuit, I think, looks really good. Um, I like how they've gone... With a sort of, it's, they've gone for a different design. And they've got the small bat ears, and he's got, and supposedly Kevin Smith, who's now like sort of the unofficial publicity guy for Man of Steel too, whatever, is uh, said it's like the black suit, well, a black cape with the grey suit and black symbol, um, which I think is a very good idea. Um, I'm it, it good to see it in colour, good to see him in moving in a suit and see how it looks. But from what I've seen, I'm very impressed. Uh, the title, Batman vs Superman: Dawn of Justice. I think sounds absolutely wank. Um, Batman versus Superman, so Batman's like headlining before Superman in a Superman sequel, and uh, Dawn of Justice is just like oh, okay, we're not actually getting a proper Superman sequel with him by with himself. So it's both apparently going to be part one of a six-part story act for this Justice League thing. <sighs> I'm not that impressed. What's the most expensive or hard to find film you own, and which holy grails have you yet to find? Hard to find Holy Grails. I kind of sold most of my sort of collectible DVDs and stuff. I mean, I, I, I had Ghostbusters 1 and 2 on Superbit DVD from Japan. I sold them maybe a week or two ago. Uh, I've got like Supergirl, like uh, limited edition set, maybe like, I think they, they made 50,000. But I'm a big Laserdisc fan and I, you know, collect. I've got things like Ghostbusters on Criterion, which is pretty cool. Um, and. Where's the and Robocop which has like you know sort of cool gatefold cover so these are things I kind of like if I, I would call 
collectible things because people now are collecting these steelbook blu-rays and I've, and charging overinflated prices for them once they're sold out it's kind of i don't know just a dvd metal box you know it's far more interesting to collect something that's massive you know like a laser disc do you have a specific limit on how old the movies have to be on your retrospective videos a movie doesn't have to be a certain age i mean there's kind of films that i am familiar with and in a in a nostalgic way so i mean i think i maybe said in a previous uh, answer where someone asked about black and white movies i mean some black and white films from maybe the 50s and 60s i may be interested in or even beyond that um but um Usually, I mean, the oldest film I've reviewed is On Her Majesty's Secret Service, which is like 1968, 69. Um, so that's the oldest film I've reviewed. Um, but usually, I mean, I cover things 80s and 90s um, at this point. But if things in the next couple of years, I'm still doing this, I may have, you know, expanded more and done more from before the 60s. Do you think that some film music, especially the Hans Zimmer knockoffs, are getting cosmetically generic, i.e. Captain America the Winter Soldier? Yes, film scores, I think, uh, at the moment, especially for big blo- big blockbuster summer movies, are drab and dull. Um, I mean, you get things like Howard Shaw doing the Hobbit films, which have amazing music. I actually adore that style of composing. Um, obviously, you know, Jerry Goldsmith passed away. John Williams is, you know, quite old now, and he's probably be retiring soon, probably after he's done Star Wars uh, sequels, maybe. Um, but there is other composers out there which, you know, don't really get the big budget film. So when you go to cinema, you're sort of stuck with the sort of Hans Zimmer knockoffs. I mean, you get Hans Zimmer's was if you, if you listen to Hans Zimmer's music from the early '90s, which is amazing film scores. And now he's kind of gone a little bit on repeat mode, and a lot of the other composers uh, are sort of copying his style, or probably even worked with him in the past. So there's a similar trend to have this sort of like similar sound, and it's just like music just to serve the background. Music now in films feels like wallpaper. It's just there, just there to be in the background. But yeah, I'm not very impressed at the moment with the latest bunch of uh, superhero film scores. The Kermode de Mayo show likes to share stories of bad and sometimes weird experiences people have in theatres. Do you have any? Not really. I've never really had any, a bad experience. You always get the odd twat talking in the background or you know making noise. But actually, when I worked as a projectionist, uh, when we were showing The Dark Knight as a screening for all these, you know, I think it was a, a, like a, a late night screening, and one of the customers had an epileptic fit in the screen and um, and and staff downstairs told me not to shut the projector off which was I found very peculiar um, but they kept playing it but the guy inside the screen in, inside the screen was screaming as he was having this fit and everyone was just sitting there just really awkwardly sort of listening to this guy having a having a you know a fit as it were but that was the only sort of weird experience I you know occurred really with me at the cinema Ollie who'd been in a fight between Superman and Batman no cop out answers allowed and which movie hero would you most like to be well, most well, the superhero I would like to be, well, yeah, one, you know, it'd be something like Superman, because you're basically indestructible. And that leads to the next question: Would Bat, would Batman take on Superman? No fucking way! It'd be like Superman would flick Batman into orbit, you know. And the whole idea of this Batman versus Superman, I, you know, notion with the next film is totally bullshit and silly. But you know, they may not occur in the film. Must be like down to Batman and Superman's philosophies on justice, you know. Um, but it would be like the, the equivalent of Mr. Bean versus the Hulk. You know, it just couldn't happen. It would be pointless. Even like Captain America couldn't take on the Hulk. So that's the equivalent of Batman versus Superman. Don't compare Batman to Mr. B. <laughs> <laughs> right, here we go. What's your process you use to do the audio? Is it one go in bits? Do you write out a script? How long does it normally take you from preparation to posting? For when doing audio, um, once I've written a review, um, after about maybe two days of writing, or maybe a whole, maybe, maybe one day, just solid writing. It will take me about half an hour to record the audio, um, depending on how long the review is. I mean, I've, I've been writing maybe three and a half thousand to four thousand words per review, um, and it takes about half an hour to read it out. And always, there's always you always end up screwing it up, you know, because when you're recording and you're talking to yourself in a room, it's always a weird feeling. Um, you've got to get past that and sort of you know focus on what you're saying, um, but. You, know, you, you always have mistakes when you're recording or noise cars and things like that but yeah it takes about half an hour to do and maybe about two hours to sort of edit it all into Final Cut Pro's uh, time frame Which famous trilogy do you prefer? Star Wars or Lord of the Rings and why? I, I, I adore both trilogies I, I'm probably going to say Lord of the Rings at this point because 
them in extended form you've got you know longer obviously longer films but there's more meat to the stories there's more there's more characters and things like that there's more I mean Star Wars is kind of a look now if you look back it's kind of a little bit inconsistent where you know they've all been abused with CGI and now been thrown in bits made it kind of sometimes some people find them unwatchable now um, episode 4 you know so much stuff thrown in it's kind of like it didn't really need that with Lord of the Rings even though there's it's got loads of CGI as well but they're more cons- the, the quality is more consistent throughout the trilogy um, and there's more emotions there And uh, but they're both good it's not anyone thinking that I don't like Star Wars I love Star Wars but Lord of the Rings now I kind of prefer why is Superman the movie your favourite film I would just like to know if it's the acting directing writing etc yeah I mean Superman the movie um, is one of my favourites because I think Christopher Reeve made such a huge impression on me as a kid I mean it's any actor really to sort of resemble a comic book character so well I mean Robert Downey Jr. looks good as you know uh, as Iron Man but Christopher Reeve is the only one who really makes it believable and he, on, off camera and on camera you know sort of maintain that sort of presence as well and um, and also everything else with Superman the direction was solid and the music was amazing and the writing and it's it's got everything in there that sort of makes a sort of good superhero movie and a good movie in general any in a general movie Number one, what inspired you to create your YouTube channel? Number two, which movie are you most excited to see this year? Number three, do you believe comic book movies should be true to their origins or should they be adapted for film? What encouraged me to do YouTube stuff? Really, it was... Um, I mean, you, I, I, I did watch other film critics and, um, and I enjoyed what they did, but they sort of, when they covered a movie, I really enjoyed They needed to maybe covered it for like two or three minutes. And I want to do something a bit longer and express my opinions. And some of them were kind of ill-informed to a certain degree, or didn't know enough about it to sort of give a give it a sort of a credible review. I'd say in my eyes, um, that's why I did Superman Four, my first one. I, don't, I can't watch it now. I can't go back and watch it because I don't like how I sound in it. Um, but that just, just basically discussing its faults and what I thought was good and why it failed was the reason why I wanted to sort of do a YouTube. Uh, channel but it wasn't at the time it wasn't like I was going to do this every week it was a one off thing and then uh, my friend said you know you should do more of these reviews and um, so I did and every week I did one did one did another and it sort of and they began to get quite popular to a certain degree quite quickly Um, so I continued doing it Um, with superhero films and origin stories I mean like they should stay faithful because you know if they're trying to adapt it, it ends up. If they, if they do adapt it, they end up changing too much, and it comes it makes it very difficult for a fan to sort of enjoy it because it feels not faithful to what they're actually gone to see. You know, if it's like, for example, if it was like a Spider-Man film adapted, they may they may change loads and think, oh, this ain't a Spider-Man film. It's totally different to what I thought it would be. Um, so yeah, staying true to the origins is the best thing to do. Um, well, Godzilla was one movie I was really excited to see, and it turned out to be relatively average. Um, so I'm probably going to say the last uh, film in the Hobbit trilogy, and probably Sin City 2. I'm, look, it'd be interesting to see that film. Why no Blade Runner retrospective? I mean, you did do Highlander 2, The Quickening. Yes, I did do Highlander 2. Um, well, Blade Runner is a film I get asked to do a lot, and the guy, you know, uh, yeah, I know he's asked me to do this. Blade Runner as well a couple of times before um, see with Blade Runner and the Alien films they all have really in-depth documentaries and I, could, I feel myself I couldn't provide anything new in terms of information uh, in regards to films production um, because these film, these documentaries have already provided that to such a great extent I couldn't do it justice um, but what I can do is provide my own opinion on the film which is what people really want to here, I presume. Um, so I've not said I'm not doing a Blade Runner film a review. I will be doing one at one point, but at the moment it's kind of it's difficult to be that um, enthusiastic to do it. But I will do it. Um, but Highlander Two was something I wanted to do because it was fun, and there was other other reviews hadn't discussed the various versions. I mean, obviously there's loads of versions of Blade Runner as well. But um, but yes, I. I haven't said I won't be doing it, but I will be doing it in the future. In the background of your room, is that the number one issue or post of Detective Comics 27 with Batman's first appearance? Uh, yes, it is. <laughs> it's a, it is the, the uh, what was it? 
Number 27, yeah, Detective Comics. Yeah, I will show, I will cut to a picture of it. So, or like a still. Where is the furthest place you shipped a poster? Well, Peter Bruce handles all the artwork and the shipping orders. So um, that's kind of out of my hands. I don't really know where it's the furthest it's gone. Um, I do have followers in you know, Japan and Australia, but the furthest I know is America. And the majority of my subscribers, maybe sixty uh, percent, are American, which is very, which is, which is cool, which is great, it's very interesting. Um, um, but yeah, America is the furthest. Ever think of doing more comedy reviews? Comedy films. Um, well, I haven't. Well, I think the first comedy film I would like to review would be something like Loaded Weapon One, because I think that's really good sort of spoof satire on the sort of action genre. Uh, Caddyshack is another good film. Um, but there isn't many that I'm desperate to do. I mean, I mean, I mean, a lot of like comedy films. There isn't well, maybe, but the ones I've read isn't much of an interesting background to how they're made. It's kind of just like you don't want the review just to consist of montages of the best jokes. You know, it just ends up being pointless. Um, but yeah, Loaded Weapon One is one I want to review. Any classic anime films you want to review? Uh, yes, I still want to review uh, Akira and Ninja Scroll. These are two that I grew up watching. So um, I've, I've already reviewed Steve Fart 2, the animated movie, but um, I'm not an expert on anime by any means. Uh, but Ninja Skull and Akira are the ones that I'm most intrigued to cover. What are among your favourite James Bond films in no particular order? Uh, my favourite Bond films uh, GoldenEye, Casino Royale, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, Living Daylights, Licence to Kill, uh, From Russia with Love, and The Spy Love Me. Who do you think should play James Bond after Daniel Craig? My picks are Hugh Dancy or Michael Fassbender. Yeah, Hugh Dancy I don't know, but um, Michael Fassbender, I think he'll be a good James Bond. If you watch X-Men First Class when he goes goes around trying to find the other Germans, I mean, because it's set perfectly in the 60s, it feels like you're watching a, you know, a Sean Connery James Bond film. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say Duncan Casey, my friend. That'll give him an ego boost. There you go, yeah. He's a good actor, so he would be a good James Bond. <laughs> Will you ever review John Carpenter's They Live? Of course I'll review They Live. I've done a commentary, but I will be doing it later on. Because there was, a, there was a, a, a time when I was doing too many John Carpenter stuff. Even though John Carpenter films are some of my most popular reviews. Um, the uh, There is a point where I had to stop for a little bit. But yes, I will get to it later on in the year. Are there any books or comics you think could never be made into a film? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> They all, they all said Watchmen was a film that couldn't be made into a film. And they still haven't. And Richard says they still haven't. But uh, it's, it's... I mean, I can't like the film, as I said earlier. But it's, you know... I haven't read many comic books to, to answer that and say what can or cannot be made into a film or a book in general. And it's, so, it's always like even like Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. They, they say some books are, un, are unfilmable. But they did it. And I thought the film, Fear, and Lo- Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas was an amazing film. Uh, so yeah it's very hard to decide so sorry I, I couldn't answer that properly number one have you considered reviewing any films from the German Expressionist and French New Wave periods number two what are your favourite Studio Ghibli films number three have you considered reviewing the movies Perfect Blue by Satoshi Kon and Manhunter by Michael Mann I would consider reviewing uh, Manhunter uh, Studio Ghibli um, probably uh, I've seen a couple of them. maybe I've seen, seen about three films he's done out of his large collection of work um, probably Spirited Away uh, it's quite a cool film um, in terms of the German films and the French New Wave um, I, don't, I haven't really I'm not an expert on that on that sort of style of filmmaking from the sort of 60s and things like that so um, I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer that question <laughs> I can't provide you with a good answer I'm sorry have you seen Vamp yet? no Phil I have not seen Vamp so not yet anyway I, I will get around to it but you know I've got a list of other films people have said have you watched this yet I'm like no I haven't but I, I will get to it what is your favourite guilty pleasure film or game guilty pleasure I mean in terms of film and games um, guilty pleasure for a video game I mean it has to be a, I suppose it has to be a game that everyone sort of hates but you like um, I don't really I mean most games I've purchased have all got good reviews so I, I don't really go out my way to sort of find a game that's kind of shit and no one really likes I suppose I quite like the Captain America 
first Avenger game they did on the Xbox 360 and PS3, or maybe it was on the Wii as well. But that was that kind of got mediocre reviews. I thought it was a quite interesting game. I quite enjoyed playing that, even though once you completed it, it's one of those games where. And so you don't, we won't play it again <laughs> so trade it in um, Guilty Pleasure Films Street Fighter the movie it's so bad it's good what is your favourite Guilty Pleasure TV series UK and US and why Guilty Pleasure um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of Red Dwarf UK TV show and I still like watching those um, season 10 was actually an improvement of the last couple they did I mean I think season 7 and 8 and the two the sort of one that was kind of a bit like Blade Runner the, the, the two part or three part episode special was a bit weak um, Red Dwarf, I've you know I always loved watching since I was a kid, and I just love the humour, and the, the sort of the just have large segments where Rimmer and Lister are just arguing for ages. That's where some of the best TV has come from. Those sort of those little moments. Uh, US show, um, my well, actually one of my favourite TV shows is Seinfeld. I've got all the seasons, and I can have to if I watch one episode or one season, I have to watch all of them again. Uh, as some of the best comedy, uh, it's still some of the best. It's still regarded as one of the best comedic shows ever made, and and it's trying to try and re- replicate that, try and replicate its success is very difficult now. Um, people have kind of tried and failed, um, but yeah, it just works so well. And Kramer, Kramer is one of the funniest characters ever. Will you do another Halloween special review of classic horror movies? Yes, October I will be doing more horror films, um, and I've got a couple of films in my mind that I will be reviewing but I'm not revealing yet so later on I will tell everyone what I'm going to be reviewing so it'll be four retrospectives and four commentaries again that month what are your favourite top five actors top five favourite actors uh, well you've also got Christopher Even there um, Kurt Russell's pretty cool um, Ian McKellen uh, two more two more come on uh, uh, oof. oh, um, Gary Oldman and Michael Coe. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, what is your opinion on Pulp Fiction? Number two, what's your preference, alien or aliens? Number three, is this your full time job or do you do other things besides your YouTube channel? Pulp Fiction, great film, fantastic film. I did own it on Laserdisc and I sold it <laughs> because someone offered me quite a bit of money for it. But I now don't, officially don't own Pulp Fiction. Um, which I will get around to getting hold of it again. Uh, Alien or Aliens? Um, is, those those films are kind of like you watch them when you're in a certain mood. So they are they are totally different in a way because Aliens obviously action packed, and the first one's more of a sort of scary horror sort of you know uh, slow burner as it were. Um, but I'd probably say Aliens because it's more you can put it on more often and sort of rewatch it Alien you have to be in the right mood and it is as I said a slower film um, but doesn't that's not a, you know a bad thing uh, but Alien's probably the one I'd watch the most because it's more action packed and, and funnier what's your favourite video game system of all time Fa- oh, okay I've owned pretty much every game's console under the sun and and, and I've never actually never owned a Playstation or Playstation 2 or 3 or, f- or <laughs> number 4 um, I've owned everything else even Neo Geo and arcade but the number one console for me is Sega Saturn it was the one I was kind of obsessed with when I was younger and I still own it this is the second one I've owned I traded it in ages ago to get an import Dreamcast and that was the biggest mistake of my life because mine had mine was chipped to play Japanese and American it had 50 60 hertz switch I had every game pretty much every rare game you can get now get on the Saturn I had I owned and I traded it all in for fuck all to get an import Dreamcast, I'm an idiot. But yes, Sega Sam, number one. What was the first movie that influenced your taste in movies? That's a very difficult question. Um, I, I don't think there's one movie that's, that could influence someone's taste in movies. I mean, that would, you could see a film, you could watch a film that could, that could inspire you to sort of um, be interested in a genre. Um, but I would say, let uh, say a film that would get you interested in filmmaking I suppose um, or Sid Man and Robocop they have such interesting backgrounds and production and the way they're made there's, there's so many great little aspects you can learn learn new ideas and learn how the filmmaking process you know uh, occurred and, and and techniques they used to create these effects and the style of, and the photographic look as well so yeah probably Sid Man and Robocop what a boring answer <laughs> If you could prevent any film from ever happening, what would you choose? Prevent any film from happening. 
Mortal Kombat Annihilation. That was fucking awful, wasn't it? That was, uh, Turtles 3 is pretty bad. Um, um, Indiana Jones 4. Did we really need that? No. Maybe, maybe the Star Wars prequels. <laughs> what is your favourite Marvel, including the Sony and Fox ones movie, and your favourite DC movie, not counting the first Superman? Okay, easy choice. Uh, favourite DC movie, Batman Begins. Really good film. Um, I think it's probably the best out of the Nolan trilogy. Um, and favourite Marvel film, not obviously including Sony and Fox. I'm going to say uh, Spider-Man 2, maybe? Or X-Men Days of Future Past. Now I've seen that. I thought that was really fucking good. So, yeah. What areas that have improved are you most proud of and what has motivated the evolution of your reviews? Clearly by the fact of the Redux reviews, you've seen a need to update and expand upon what you did early on. I think for most of my followers who have followed me for the last couple of years and new people are sort of going through my reviews from maybe number one to now, uh, they've seen me change a lot in terms of my style and presentation and the confidence in my voice. Talking for reviews is not something you can pick up straight away. It has to, it's a learning process. Um, and you have to get the timing right and how you pronounce things. I mean, I the annoying thing is it's difficult when you do a review and you've got like people with silly surnames and trying to get their names correct. People like, and the first thing people criticize you on, even though they've watched the entire video, they go, you said this person's name wrong. It's like, no, thanks, you know. But I think in terms of the, my reviews I got longer, I'm, cover, I'm covering more stuff now and I'm more um, critical on things. I mean, I was a little quite lenient on other films and I didn't mention certain things. I think that's why I went back and redid Robocop 3. I was not happy at all with the presentation and my review itself. It was all aspect ratios are wrong and and that's why I went back and redid that and uh, redid Superman 4 as well because I wanted to sort of say more about it and, and improve the presentation. Um, so yeah, I think most people are probably clearly aware that things have improved a lot since my first review. What do you do for a living and what part of the UK are you from? Um, what do I do for a living? Well, I do a little bit of freelance work, but that's really difficult now, now and again uh, to find. Uh, if you want to, if you if you, you want to work for like a you know a proper business like that, that produce videos or produce trailers, they expect you to know everything now, and for the same amount of money. So they want you to know. Adobe After Effects. They want you to know Photoshop. They want you to know Avid. They want you to know um, Adobe Premiere. They want you to know Final Cut Pro. They want you to know everything. All this software, which costs thousands of pounds, they want you to know all of it, and they want to pay like twenty four k a year. That'd be it. And it's like really difficult. And they make it sometimes they make it so difficult for you to apply for a job um, because they've already given it to someone else. They're just advertising it because they have to advertise it. Um, but for me, I do a little bit of freelance work here and here and there. But most of my revenue now really is coming from Final, uh, from YouTube. But that's not much at all. It's like slim pickings. Uh, but it's not, it's, it's not no one else's fault. It's my fault. You know, it's I'm I I chosen to pursue this direction um, and seeing how I can this year if it sort of pays off in a way, I will continue doing it. But if not, then I may have to sort of you know you know go and find. A sort of dead end job to sort of you know pay the bills, um, but yes, this is what I'm doing at the moment, majority of the time. Where I'm from in the UK, I'm from Cambridge. Have you ever thought about doing an audio movie retrospective podcast with Richard and Duncan? What I'm thinking from the question is, I think for I presume you're meaning an audio commentary for a film. Um, me having me, Richard and Duncan in a commentary. Sounds like a great idea, and I think we'll probably will do it at one point. We still want to do like a video special where there's three of us on camera watching a film or something and um, filming our reactions. Um, so that will be an interesting way to go. But for things like retrospectives, like a video, like things I do now, that's only with me. That's my sort of personal um, videos. Um, but yeah, further podcasts with Richard and Duncan, I'm always up for. So that'd be great. Have you ever seen the classic Clint Eastwood Richard Burton movie Where Eagles Dare? Uh, no, I've not seen that film and I feel bad because there's a lot of Clint Eastwood films I've not seen and people have asked me numerous times would I review a Clint Eastwood film uh, it's like a classic, it's like Dirty Harry but there's one from 1992 which is like Unforgiven which there is somewhere in this house there's, that DVD is here somewhere which I need to watch it's supposed to be an amazing film Please tell us about your experience working as a projectionist I worked as a projectionist for seven years um, 
it was it was a good time i really enjoyed being a projectionist because after a year of just being a standard projectionist i was up i was you know promoted to a they, cine world I, it's a company i work for they called them technicians other cinemas will call them chief projectionists so basically being a technician they basically get you to do other jobs around the cinema like painting or repairing stuff like they'd, like, they'd say something like oh the toilet's broken do you want to fix it oliver I'm, like, I'm not a fucking plumber i'm not fixing that so but apart from that part of the job everything else was great because the manager i respected he let me do my own thing so you know i just run the booth you know you're away from all the customers and having to rip tickets and serve popcorn for all the plebs you know it was you're your own, you're essentially your own boss and putting prints together i remember putting together bubba hotep like the, the only print of it in the uk well, from what i remember that was printed by anchor bay that was quite interesting and uh, i think maybe the second or i think a remastered print of taxi driver i handled and put together that was quite cool uh, but i my sort of time came to an end when digital came in when Cineworld invested in digital projection 3d and stuff so i was there for when it was though i had half 35 millimeter and half digital and and i left when they essentially then they kitted it all out with digital so basically the magic of cinema is essentially gone because it's all digital projection and everything comes on a hard drive and this, this they, they call it ingesting it's a bit weird name ingesting to some sort of giant skynet unit and it sort of transfers it to all the other projectors and that's it and that is that's projecting you just create a playlist and press play and it's boring you know that's there's a fun in that you know the best things were like you know when you put the film together spool it all onto you know onto the projector platters and then you know play it through and there's always accidents you know you always get film get trapped in the film gate and catches fire or like it gets jambled up in the middle but that rarely happened on my shift but uh i did put the wrong film on once i put a horror film on for kids by accident and it made the papers literally i put a film called a film called rika on in a in a screen and all these kids went in and they sat through the trailers the parents did as well and these trailers were 18 rated trailers but no one said anything till the first scene in the film someone gets decapitated <laughs> and then they came out crying i was so i felt so bad i was but i think at the time i was trying to change a projector lamp xenon lamp and it got stuck i had to run back and forth and i put the wrong film on them yeah and my manager was cool about it but he goes all of it they're really upset and i was like i was you know shocked but uh, it made the papers and um, people can you know, obviously complain but yay my sort of 10 minutes of fame without my name being mentioned thank fuck silly world just basically said it was a mistake errors occur so yes that's my experience who are your favorite superheroes and supervillains well, i think we've already discussed my favorite superhero film superheroes everyone knows who my, superman is my favorite but super villains, I would say probably the Joker. Joker's pretty cool. And Venom. I like Venom. He's good. Good choice. <laughs> are your regular friends and family who are not into the material aware of your success and how popular your videos and output are? I think they are kind of aware. My sisters, uh, I think one of my sisters is on my Facebook group. I mean, she's aware of what I do and she's seen some of my videos. I've got three sisters, so the other ones have seen some of it and they, they thought it was really good. But I don't think they are aware of what I do to such a great, great extent. Um, I mean, I don't think I'm that, I'm kind of, my channel's kind of niche in a way, you know. I'm not like up there with 100,000 followers or whatever, but um but I, I, my, my, my parents know what I do and my dad's seen a few videos and they respect what I do and they're letting me get on with it for the time being. And if it doesn't work out, then they'll be like, well, Oliver, you've got to find a proper job. <laughs> so we'll see, we'll see. But yeah, they're, they're kind of aware. Question one, what do you make of the whole Edgar Wright situation with Ant-Man? Question two, are we ever going to get a sequel to Dread? Question three, will you be placing a bet on England to win the World Cup? Uh, World Cup football, I don't like football, so I probably won't be making any bets but I probably will watch the World Cup I think it's one of the things with football it's kind of like I don't, I couldn't give a toss about it but when the World Cup's on I generally do watch it um, with Ant-Man and Edgar Wright I I mean at the moment it's all speculation about why he left it's all created differences and someone said oh Marvel wanted to shoot on digital and Edgar wanted to shoot on film and um, but now Ed, Edgar Wright's left I have no interest in that film he was the only key ingredient to keep me interested in Ant-Man. 
I think I think Edgar Wright should go make the Banana Man movie. Um, getting a sequel to Dread. Um, well, I don't know. I'm not making the movie, <laughs> but I think the only way you're going to get one is if everyone out there who's seen who who's seen the film should own it on Blu-ray. Don't download it illegally or whatever, or borrow it from a friend. Go buy it because if you buy it, it gives them more incentive to go make it. Um, but at the moment, it just seems to be kind of rumours, and Carl Urban seems you know desperate to do one and the producer seems like you know that, that nothing at the moment it's not it's not going anywhere so um we'll see we'll see we were wondering since so many of the movies you've covered have either been remade or had their franchises rebooted do you think these remakes reboots detract from the nostalgic artistic value of the originals i don't think the reboots distract at all um it just it just um goes to show that the remakes are just totally pointless Robocop remake, awful and a total bore. Nightmare on Elm Street remake, forgettable. No one's even mentioned it again. Texas Chainsaw Massacre has been remade twice, isn't it? Since it, you know, last couple of years. Total Recall, re, you know, reboot was pointless and just crap. Everything that's been remade has not at all made any dent on the originals. The thing is, I mean, horror. There was a point where remakes are not a bad thing. Me and Richard have discussed this before. There is good ways to do re- to to do remakes. I mean, we've had horror films like Body Snatchers, The Thing, The Fly, all remakes, classic, you know, fifties horror. Um, so it can be done, but we just they're just left in the hands of fucking idiots. You can't, you know, who are desperate to sort of, you know, nod, a wink to the original, but try to do something different, but end up epically failing because they end up deterring so far from the original, or they try to go so far but end up going back to the original. Not if you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, I don't think it distract. It doesn't, doesn't do, it doesn't do any harm, or doesn't distract from the original version they're remaking. Do you collect hot toys, or is your Christopher Reeve Superman the only exception? Uh, the hot toys Christopher Reeve thing is the only one. If I had more money, I would probably go get the hot toys, uh, Michael Keaton, Batman, and Robocop hot toys figure. But they're probably sold out now, and probably worth double the amount they were charging. But yes, they're the only ones, unfortunately. If you want to see like more like hot toy stuff, uh, if you go check out Stu Murray's channel because he's got everything on Superman related stuff. If you like, obviously, if you like Superman stuff, he's got pretty much every Superman figure on the planet on his YouTube channel. So yeah, go watch that. You should start a Patreon page. It's a statement. Yeah, it's a statement and not a question. But uh, but yeah, I can answer it to a certain degree. I mean, I have thought about Patreon. Uh, I I was chatting with. Um, you know guru larry about it and he was on the fence about it as well and and other youtube channels or you know create content creators on blip like red letter media and uh spoonie experiment they've got they've done their own uh, patreon page and they've you know getting a lot of revenue from that um but i i don't know i don't think i'm popular enough to ask for that to do that and i feel bad i, I mean the british mentality is you don't like you don't ask people for money you don't like you don't like asking people for you don't, you don't ask people how much they're paid either you know you don't say so you don't you don't go ask someone you know how much you earn they're always a bit like i'm not telling you um so when it comes to things like patreon where you ask people to donate money to um, on a monthly subscription um i kind of feel i don't know what to do um, i have thought about it though and the options maybe i would if i was going to do a patron would be you know, you get to see the review a day or two before it's listed, so it will be unlisted on YouTube, but you can see it um, if you're a subscriber. And I have already put all the audio commentaries I've done with Richard and Duncan onto a database, so that people can download them via MP3 to their iPod or whatever device you use, instead of having to stream it via your phone on YouTube, eating your battery and eating up your, you know, um, how many megabytes you have per second on download. Um, so yeah that's all on database so that may be one option for you know giving people an incentive to subscribe um, but it would only be like maybe 5, 10, 15 dollar subscriptions it wouldn't be anything beyond that if I did beyond that it may be something like you know 20 or 30 bucks you can we can chat on Skype for an hour or something like that with people who pay more I don't know it's just an idea but let me let, let me know what you guys think um, if it would be ideal would you want to do that would you want to see me do that um, that would help boost revenue but I have to you know it's, once you start talking about an avenue and revenue all the time on YouTube it becomes just like you're doing it all for money you know 
and I don't want it to be like that. It should be like I'm doing this because I want to do it, not because people are paying me to do it. But you know, with all things, you know, it's it's nice to be rewarded for your hard work. So we'll see, we'll see. What movie do you wish you directed, and what is it about movies that makes you want to make reviews? Movie I wish I had directed. That's that's, that's quite interesting. Um, I wish I could have directed Sidman Four because I would have done a far better job than Sin J Fury because he could not direct traffic. Um, I would have done a far, you know it's the way you know how things have been framed, how he still told the story, you know how he directed the, the actors. It's it's a very sloppy job. I wish I could have done it, but you know it's I'm not really a director, so I couldn't really go around saying. I, I want to do this I want to remake that but um, for movies that make me want to review them it's kind of like when you see other people discuss a film they're all it's it's interesting to see what their opinion is and sometimes they miss things out or they you see it differently so if you see it differently then it's a good incentive to review it but sometimes I think I watch a film a classic film and think oh I'd love to make that into a trailer and then I do it and think oh I might just review the film now so that's why you know all these retrospectives always have trailer essentially a trailer at the beginning at the end so you're getting two trailers for one film so that's quite you know not everyone does that i don't think everyone else does that with review, with reviews online um so there isn't there's always something like uh, for example um highlander 2 you know it's just to be the incentive to review that would be to discuss the alternative cuts or what's been changed that could be a major incentive for me to review it but yes, that's, hopefully that's answered your question. Why, in the later retrospectives slash reviews, have you focused more on popular and well-known films like Star Wars and Terminator 2, where beforehand you would talk more about hidden gems such as Leviathan, Outland, and Somewhere in Time? Very good question. Um, that has been brought to my attention a few times by some of my sort of regular followers, people who followed me from the beginning. When reviewing popular films, I mean, most of my requests for reviews come from people who want to see reviews of popular films. And I don't like to say no to people, but during a couple of years, I would get requests for Star Wars, Terminator, Ghostbusters, and I've no problem reviewing them, but it can be, a, the issue can can be where, what else is there to say? But if you go back and look at those reviews I've done on those films, um, they're probably the most, my most popular reviews. So if you are a YouTuber, want to do your own videos, doing popular films is, doing popular films is the way to build up your audience. Because a lot of my followers and subscribers subscribed through the, those reviews of Terminator 1 and 2 and, and Ghostbusters, etc. I like doing films which are kind of uh, B-movies or films that people have forgotten, like Leviathan, you know, things like that. Um, it does, you know, help people to be aware of, you know, a better selection of movies. But um, it's not saying I'm not going to do them anymore. I'm going to go, I will go back to those because it also makes it easier for me in, to, in avoiding content ID stuff because if you do popular films they're always going to get flagged by someone and uh, doing the obscure stuff is always kind of like no one really gives a toss about those films so it makes it easier to uh, to review them not having to be blocked on mobile devices or blocked in other countries in Europe yeah so I will be going back to some more obscure stuff but not not always doing popular films but there's always going to be a mix because you have to provide reviews for 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 both sides of the coin as it were you mentioned Laserdisc a lot in your retrospectives. What are the advantages of still using or enjoying the format in 2014? Um, there isn't major advantages of using Laserdisc. Um, Laserdisc itself, you know, has like the best sound still, I think. Um, it's difficult to, I mean, Blu-rays you get DTS master audio, but there's something about Laserdisc sound which kind of sounds a bit more richer and fuller. So it's the old argument of vinyl versus CD. But with picture wise, I mean, you know, you get a better picture on DVD. But if you want to get the best picture from a laser disc, you really have to invest in a good player. I mean, a lot of people just buy the bog standard UK models, you know, or like a DVL players where you've got DVD and laser disc combined. They're not good players. You need to get a Pioneer Elite models or Japanese ones that were produced maybe the late 90s. I mean, there's a good laser disc players built in 93, 94, but they're Pioneer models elite ones um but having laser disc today it really is for people collection collecting value i mean you get great box sets you get great extra material but some material you don't get on dvd and and blu-ray because of licensing issues um but some people prefer to watch the laser disc movie of their classic films say say for example robocop uh, if you're used to watching it in that sort of 
video resolution and then you watch it on Blu-ray, it's a huge leap in quality in terms of it's closer to 35 millimeter print, but it may be too detailed or grainy to sort of, it may distract your viewing, viewing experience. So something like, uh, like Halloween may look a lot better on Laserdisc than it does on DVD and Blu-ray because it's got that sort of softness to it. Um, it's really down to personal preference, really. Um, I mean, I, I'm still keeping Laserdisc, even though it's the quality is not as good in terms of video quality, and um, but it's still neat to have. So if you're if you're a hardcore movie fan and like collecting stuff, Laserdisc is the best way to go. I mean, DVDs and Blu-rays, just a DVD case. It's boring. You want some massive box set, which is so big, gives you a hernia when you pick it up. You know, but yeah. I hope that's answered your question, Joel. <laughs> what is your least favourite movie, favourite movie character, favourite movie franchise, favourite action movie? Favourite movie character? Um, I'm going to go with Snake Plissken. He's cool. I, I like Kurt Russell in that. Uh, favourite movie, um, favourite action genre or action movie? Um, it's difficult to say. Um, Terminator 2 is a really good action film. Um, well, maybe one of the Die Hard films. Die Hard 1's really good. Die Hard 3 is really cool. I mean, there's so many. It's, it's difficult to choose. Movie franchise. Um, I mean, I said earlier, it was, uh, I think Guy Oscar had asked me a question on favourite trilogy, Lord of the Rings and all Star Wars. I mean, in terms of a franchise, um, Lord of the Rings is pretty good. I mean, I think they're consistently good, I think. Um, many people may disagree. Um... I mean, the Alien films are good as well. I mean, it's also they're inconsistent as well. You've got three and four. I mean, three, Alien 3 is an amazing film, but um, they're inconsistent as well. So it's very hard to choose a franchise, but um, I'm going with Lord of the Rings for now. Um, and least favourite movie? Um, it's probably going to be, as I said earlier, Double Dragon is pretty bad. I mean, there's worse films out there. Far worse. I mean, people say when people say to you, you know, Batman and Robin is the worst film ever made, you go, well, it's clearly not because you're not seeing many movies. There are far more bad films out there. Um, it just seems to be the popular choice because someone else said it was, you know. Um, um, but I'm, I'm going to go with Double Dragon. That's fucking awful. Um, but there may be some, like Spice World, the movie, a Spice Girls film. It's dreadful. Or that Keith Lemon film, if you're in the UK, that was fucking awful. So yeah, apologise for my swearing. What do you think about the current standard of movies turned out by Hollywood? These days I find myself more drawn to independent cinema as your reviews prove they don't make them like they used to. Um, I suppose with films they are made in the past now in saying they, don't, they weren't made like they were used to, I mean it's kind of, it is a nostalgic value to all, all these films. Because if you grew up watching them, there's always going to be you know, a strong connection to that movie. If someone now, like this generation, watch an old film from the 80s, they may, think, they may see it entirely different. Um, but for Hollywood films now, how they're made, um, I think movies today are very much overly hyped. I mean, when I worked as a projectionist, you know, you see the list of films coming out, and you'd see loads of sequels, loads of superhero films. Think, oh, it's going to be a great summer. It turns out to be really shit or really average. And maybe one film out of a selection of maybe like six films that you're looking forward to was good. Um, I th I think yeah. I mean. Films are made differently today. I mean, obviously there's loads of great films that people miss because they're re released via independent cinema. Like uh, maybe, like uh, if you, the best thing to do is support your local, you know, picture house or independent cinema chain if they're showing art house films, you know, films that aren't, you know, given that much publicity because you find more, far more interesting films, I think. Um, I'm not gonna go into highlight which particular film you should go out and see, but, um, there's definitely more hidden gems in the independent cinema so yes uh but with terms of nostalgic stuff or like films how they weren't made like they were used to films you know if you like films that are made more with practical effects then stuff from the 80s and even before that you know uh i put the ideal film for you but yes i hope i've answered your question give you an, a decent response who's your favorite cinematographer my favorite director of photography probably will be alex thompson who, direct, who photographed Alien 3 and Legend and Leviathan. He unfortunately passed away a couple of years ago, so um, this is a huge shame. Um, but yeah, I think he's, you know, he produced the best looking film for me, which was Legend. Um, it just looks stunning. So yeah, Alex Thompson, my favorite director of photography. Well, that's all the questions.
I've answered. Uh, hopefully, I've given you guys, you know, a decent answer to everything. And there's one or two questions I, I felt I couldn't answer, which I left out, but I may cover on later on in a, in a further in a in a future Q and A. Um, but yes, I hope you all enjoyed it and found it informative. And I will be back with another video special later on, with including Richard and Duncan. I think we're going to be watching watching a film and uh, filming our responses to it. So yes, look out for that. Take care, everyone, and goodbye.